The Gloriana Set by Thebe Moon Read by Alamex Mabella Chapter 23 A Complex Verbal Threat Malfoy kept his distance from Hermione the next day, his posture stiff and his face unreadable, and Hermione did the same. It was the only proper course, and she had the flowchart to prove it. Ginny threw another party Friday night in the Gryffindor Common Room, inviting eighth year Ravenclaws and Hufflepuffs, but not Slytherins, not even Blake. Hermione spent most of the evening on the sofa with Ron, drinking as little as possible and trying not to think back to the rich taste of science scotch and a long, pale finger gently tugging a curl. Do I frighten you that much? On Saturday, she and Ron met Harry in Hogsmeade, and the trio spent the day and night getting thrown out of various cafes and pubs. They ended up at the Hogshead again, where Hermione began covertly turning Harry's eyebrows different colours and pretending to see nothing when Ron drunkenly pointed it out. The two men finally caught on and started chasing her around the pub, tripping over the empty bottles she rolled in their way, until Harry finally bound Hermione to a chair with an incarcerous spell and began whispering in her ear all the ways he was going to fail her newt. Her screams finally got them expelled from the hog's head for frightening the clientele. Hermione was so distracted she'd forgotten that the second Monday in October was the introduction to the fabulous winkweed plant in double herbology after weeks of observation and essay writing. Her pulse sped up when she entered the small greenhouse and saw a tarp-covered object in the center of each table. Professor Sprout was bobbing on her ears, her face flushed with excitement. All right, class, she said. You are now ready to meet the star of the show. First, a quick review. Can anyone tell me about the specimens we're about to study? Hermione and Astoria never raised their hands in the same instant. Miss Greengrass? These sprouts have yet to bloom, Astoria said with icy precision. The stamen is fully developed, however, producing poisonous pollen that can be released in clouds if the plant feels threatened. The seeds, however, are immature, and while they can be shot out at high velocities, they have not yet developed in magical attacks. Excellent. Don't mind this Slytherin, Rod said. It is very important that once the wingweeds are uncovered, that no one stutters or upsets them. They are likely sleeping now, and you all want to keep them that way. No noise muffling spells allowed. This is an observational lesson only. You will make a drawing of your particular plant, noting any distinctive features, and label them as you did at the start of this lesson. We will save more dangerous activities, like watering the plants or setting them in direct sunlight, for the next week. The student nodded in agreement, eyeing their covered plans nervously. Now, Sprout said, who can tell us the steps to take if a plant is awakened? And keep in mind, if one plant is awakened, it will likely wake up the other, so quick action is vital. Again, Hermione, Astoria, and Neville raised their hands at once, and Sprout nodded at Hermione. The first step is to loom threateningly over the plant, as close as possible, Hermione said. The winkweed might think you are a larger plant and curl up, especially since it is still a seedling. If the plant doesn't retreat, the next step is point your wand at it while delivering a complex verbal threat. Why a complex verbal threat? Sprout asked. The winkweed considers itself a powerful being. A complex threat positions you as a superior being capable of imaginative destruction. Yes, and points to Gryffindor. Mr. Malfoy. What other qualities necessary for the threat to work? It has to be heartfelt, Malfoy said, sounding bored. The student has to appear ready and willing to carry out whatever he or she says, no matter how dangerous. Yes, was all Sprout said. She never rewarded students who waited to be called on, an attitude that Hermione considered commendable. And here we come to the heart of the plant's name. Obviously, we do not want any of you to damage your plants. They are far too rare and valuable, but a plant does not know that. So it challenges to fool it into believing you're serious, to hoodwink it. Hermione thought back to the fur-trapping wizard who first discovered the plant. He had fortunately been an avid poker player with a flaming temper and an intemperate tongue. All right, glass, uncover your plants, Brad said. Astoria, predictably, shifted her stool farther away, leaving Hermione to pull off the top. Damn, coward Slytherins, Hermione thought, noting that Neville was left to uncover his as well. The wingweed plant didn't look dangerous, especially as a seedling. It was about a foot tall with small green buffs that would open to become blossoms. 
Its thorns were tiny, but still looked sharp. Its main stem and leaves were curled and sleep, and Hermione let out a breath she didn't realize she was holding. Astoria spread out her parchment and began sketching, and Hermione did the same. Soon the only sound in the greenhouse was the scratching of quills on the parchment. Astoria apparently included a flair for drawing in her long lists of talents, and her meticulous sketch was a work of art with lovely cross-hatchings on the leaf. Hermione's was merely serviceable. After thirty minutes of silence, the seventh-year Slytherin boys began speaking in low voices, and Astoria decided it was time to chat as well. Oh, but Trussell is still there, you know, she murmured. Why, Astoria, I didn't know you cared, Hermione said, retracting her drawing's jagged line of the stem. Would you like a large wedding? It was signed years ago, the Slytherin continued, keeping her voice low. Signed, sealed, and consummated. Astoria smirked. Consummated repeatedly. I don't need to hear about your Akai customs, Hermione said at regular volume. This isn't 1470. She was alluding to a wizarding tradition begun that year where betrothals were consummated before both sets of families to ruin their prospective brides for anyone else. She'd spent an eye-opening hour on Sunday researching pureblood betrothals. Pureblood academic interests, of course. Astoria's hand clenched on her quill, but her voice remained cool and low-pitched. Draco's name might be slightly tarnished, but not for long. He is clearly plotting the Malfoy's return to power. Perhaps, Hermione said, putting down her quill and finally looking at her partner. But repairing that family's reputation could take decades. Are you willing to wait that long? You've given this some thought, Granger. Astoria purred. Hermione shrugged. It's rather obvious. Death Eaters and their families have little choice but to atone as best as they can, contribute to the greater good, and hope time does the rest. A hard road, Astoria said. Some prefer a less rigorous path. Then they will fail, Hermione asserted. There are no shortcuts here unless one wants to be dogged by fear and suspicion for the rest of his or her life. She held Astoria's eyes. And that goes for the family's precious heirs as well. Are you sure you want to be Lady Malfoy, Greengrass? Are you sure you want that for your children? Her voice had risen near the end, and her final words rang out in the silence. The plant before her quivered, and Hermione snapped her mouth shut. She couldn't help but look over Astoria's shoulder at Malfoy, and his horrified expression made her stomach twist. She looked down at her trembling hands, already regretting her words. How could she say such a thing? Them, that Astoria! The plan drooped again, to both women's relief, and Hermione dared to hope that she'd at least shut Astoria up for good. She glanced over at Malfoy and Neville's table again, and was alarmed to see Neville's sleeve tip over his inkpot. He righted it immediately, but the table was slightly tilted, and a thin rivulet of ink ran quickly toward a trailing winkweed vine. Never! she hissed. Neville looked up at her, startled while Malfoy, lost in his own obviously unpleasant thoughts, hadn't noticed. A drop of ink touched the vine. Neville Malfoy! Hermione said louder. Sliding off her stool and stepping closer to their table, the little plant shot straight up, rattling its leaf menacingly. Both men understood the situation instantly and leaped to their feet, ones out. The plant's vines whipped out, reaching for Neville, and Malfoy shoved his partner aside, knocking over his stool. The noise enraged the plant, and it turned on Malfoy. Get Sprout! Hermione told the Slytherin boy and drew her own wand. Astoria stood smoothly to the other side of their table, further from the threatening plant. Hermione stepped closer to Malfoy. Ranger! Malfoy warned, moving between her and the plant and raising his wand. Sloming height wasn't enough. The plant was fully awake now. Fire! Hermione said. Malfoy nodded and addressed the plant. I will burn you to ash in an instant. Incendienda! For an instant, Hermione thought he had done it. Destroyed his winkweed on the first day. His face was a mask of fury, and his voice, while pitched low to avoid waking the other plants, was bursting with power. But then she realized he had pronounced the last syllable of the charm incorrectly, and Malfoy would never make such a mistake. The winkweed obviously believed him, however. The plant curled back into its pod, unharmed, and when Sprout burst in, all three plants were sleeping and Hermione was helping Neville to his feet. 
Shroud waved her wand, covering the plants and casting a spell, shielding them from any noise. What happened here? she demanded. Oh, I knocked over my ink pot. Never said miserably. Some of the ink reached the plant's leaf. It probably thought you were trying to water it, Shroud said. Hoodwinks hate to be watered. You were able to quiet it, however. Malfoy did, Never said. He knocked me down and confronted it, threatening to burn it up. Very good, Mr. Malfoy. Trying to points of Slytherin, Shroud said. She wrapped her wand and levitated the three plants into a cabinet and closed it. I think we've done enough practical applications today. Each of you will write an essay on today's incident and the lessons learned. Leave your scrolls on the tables. She turned and left the greenhouse again. Uh, thanks, Malfoy. Hermione heard Neville say as she returned to her stool. Next time, I'll let you deliver the threat, Longbottom. Malfoy drawled. Oh, I could use a good laugh. I was quiet in the small greenhouse once more, and Hermione was outlining her wingweed essay and trying not to look at Malfoy when she noticed that Astoria wasn't writing. She looked up to see the blonde woman eyeing her. What now? Hermione asked. Astoria's hat was tilted slightly. Oh, the heroic girl, Draco, really, to protect his partner? Yes, he's a peach, Hermione said. So passionate under that cool exterior. Astoria murmured. From a low tone, she could be describing the characteristic of quality parchment. So demanding. You don't say, Hermione's hand never faltered as she wrote. Draco was insatiable in sixth year, Astoria gave her a thin smile. And now he is a man. The man ignored her, drawing up a timeline of the events after the ink touched Neville and Malfoy's winkweed. Some might consider his taste somewhat debauched. Asari went on, her voice still low, sitting closer, her tongue flicking out between white teeth. Such imagination. Such appetites. Can a pretty little bookworm ever satisfy them? Hermione carefully placed her quill beside her parchment and looked straight at Astoria. The blood pounded in her head, but her voice was cool. Yes, Greengrass, I am a proper person and a scholar, and I will not apologize for it. So sad, Astoria said again, now writing. Hermione leaned closer, and she also kept her voice low this time. I'll tell you what's sad. Remember Dolores Umbridge? You're just like her, you know. That same sweet, venomous tongue. She looked into Astoria's eyes. You live in fear, don't you, little green grass? That horrible fear that someone will look past that lovely shell and see the empty, disgusting toad of a person inside. Two spots of color appeared on Astoria's cheek, and she began breathing sharply through her nose. So I'm pretty right now, aren't you, little girl? Hermione continued relentlessly, her voice still low. It was going to fucking end this. Right here, right now. But you won't always be pretty. Better find yourself a title quickly, Greengrass, before the bulging toad eyes and white toad smile come out in your face and you're just a tall, skinny umbrage with a little diamond bow in your... As her wand was out, her face contorted with fury. Groosh! Hermione's right hand touched her wand inside her skirt pocket and she murmured softly, simultaneously disarming Astoria summoning the Slytherin's wand into her own hand and slamming Astoria against the greenhouse wall. Two glass panes cracked but held, and Astoria slid to the floor, dazed and choking just a little bit. Malfoy stepped forward, but Hermione flung out an open hand, halting him without looking. He stalked over to the Slytherin woman, who blinked up at her from the stone floor. Hermione bent down slightly to make eye contact. Never! Pull a wand on me again, green grass, she said loudly. You will lose every time. She tossed Astoria's wand on the floor, then summoned her back and left the classroom, pushing past the startled Professor Sprout. Once outside the greenhouse, she ran blindly, pounding down a thin path and finding herself outside Hagrid's hut. Curve magical creatures had apparently ended, and she saw only the stone hut and adjoining garden with its giant pumpkins. She paused, catching her breath, then trudged onward. A quiet hour with Hagrid and some hot tea would do her a world of good. With luck, she could stay out of the castle until dinner time. The hut was dark, however, the door shut and no sign of Hagrid or Fang. Hermione began circling the small stone building to make sure. 
Footsteps crunched the leaves behind her, too quick and light to be Hagrid's, and Hermione turned to see Malfoy round the corner of the hut. Hermione! He advanced toward her, grasping her upper arm and looking into her face. Are you all right? I'm not the one you should be asking, Hermione said. Oh, I don't care if she's half dead. What happened back there? She looked up at him, and he stared back, hands still on her arm, his eyes the same color as the clouds looming over the castle behind him. Hermione had always believed that nearly any difficult situation could be overcome given a moment of rational thought. But Malfoy's sudden nearness and Astoria's recent words were too powerful. Her mind couldn't focus. Can't you mean it repeatedly? His appetites are debauched, insatiable. No prim little bookworm can ever. Her anger blazed up again, no longer cold, now crackling and furious. How dare she? And Hermione shook off Malfoy's hand and grabbed his tie, pulling him to her and crashing her lips against his so hard their teeth cracked together. Neither backed away, though, and this time Malfoy's hand slid around her waist under her robe, pulling her body to his. She released a tie and plunged her hands into his thick, silky hair she remembered from the infirmary. It was a second-floor corridor again, but this time there was no softness, only raw need and the words, I can, I can, I can, pounded in her head. His magic surrounded her. She could feel its pulsing in time with her heart. Hermione! He moaned against her mouth, his arms like iron, pulling her so tightly to him that she could hardly breathe and, frankly, didn't care. His lips were rough, desperate, like he had to fit a world's worth of kisses into a few short minutes. His body pushed her against a stone heart. She could feel his arousal, his other hand sliding down her hip, demanding. Demanding? Passionate? A sorry, it's a voice. Our betrothal is still valid. And her coolly superior face bloomed in Hermione's mind, and she jerked away, panting. Malfoy stepped back, his arms dropping to his side. No, no, she stuttered, nearly falling over Pumpkin Vine. I'm, I meant what I said. This changes nothing. Malfoy growled in frustration. He looked beautifully rumpled. Cheeks flushed, hair tousled, tie skewed. Hermione swallowed. Do I have Astoria to thank for this, then? He asked, striving for his usual draw. Whatever she said, it must have been a treat. You don't need to know, Hermione snapped. Just leave. She wouldn't do this. She just wouldn't. All right, then, he said coldly, eyes narrowed. You've made yourself very clear. Go lead Theo on a merry chase while you sort out what you really want. He brushed past without looking at her and disappeared around the corner again. Hermione stayed behind in Hagrid's garden, her shoes sinking into the soft earth, tears running down her cheeks until she could no longer hear the crunching and shuffling of leaves under his feet as he walked away. To be continued. Thank you for listening to this chapter of The Gloriana Set by Theba Moon. If you'd like to stay up to date on upcoming chapters and stories, you can follow me on YouTube, Spotify or AO3.